God bless you for choosing to listen to this anointed message from Dr. Reverend Christopher Abulame of King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations. Jesus, finding Jesus, finding Jesus. Hey, ask somebody, have you found Jesus? <laughs> Tell him I found him, glory to God, and he found me too. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so finding Jesus is represented in this chapter 2 of Matthew in parts of the synoptic gospels. And but we're going to look at the Matthew's account of how Christ was born. And the Bible says undeniably in fulfillment of scripture in verse 1, now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. It's important that we highlight the fact that he was born in Bethlehem because when you go back to the Old Testament, Machi chapter 5 and verse 2, there's a prophecy of the birthing of Jesus Christ or the Messiah or the anointed one in Bethlehem. And so he was born in Bethlehem as a fulfillment of scripture. And we all remember the event that led to the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ and Joseph, his earthly father, finding themselves in Bethlehem. And it only shows to us that circumstances are arranged by God. Circumstances are arranged by God. There are certain circumstances that God arranges in your life to bring you ultimately to his prophecy, his plan, and purpose for your life. And sometimes you don't know how those circumstances come together. But in the divine will of God and the awesome power of God, he's able to regulate circumstances. And not just circumstances in terms of nature, but circumstances in terms of people. And sometimes your haters bring you to your very point where God wants you to be. And most time we... We're upset at our haters, not knowing that ultimately they're helping you to fulfill the will of God for your life. And, and the same way, sometimes God uses people who are hard on you. They're hard on you because God wants to bring the best out of you. And, and most time we reject those circumstances. But let's not forget that all things, all things work together for the good of those who love God and them who call according to his purpose. So if I love God, and if I'm called, in whatever situation I find myself, I learn to look to God and say, God, I know that your word said it, that this ultimately will work for my good. It's not going to work against me. It will work for me. The wind will work for me. The wild wind will work for me. The storm will work for me. The waves will work for me. Whatever I encounter in life will work for me ultimately. And sometimes it doesn't happen so quickly. And because we are in a hurry. And we want it ha happening today. We want it done today. But God is saying, take a walk with me. Take a walk with me. With Abraham, it was not easy. Uh, the promise was given to him 25 years before. But the man worked with God. And every year that passed by, drew him closer to the place of promise. And he endured all things for 25 years. But God Almighty, he obtained the promises. So we see Jesus located in Bethlehem by the act of God. Bethlehem means the land of bread or the city of bread. And so you find here that the bread of life is born in the city of bread. Not coincidental. God made it that way. And Bethlehem also was the city of David. And royalty had to be bestowed on Jesus. For he is the root of Jesse and the branch of David. For out of David shall come this Messiah. So it has to be fulfilled in the location where it's called the city of David. And so God allowed King Herod to begin a work that will ultimately help us understand finding Jesus. And here you see... The Bible talks about the wise men who came from the east to Jerusalem. They were looking for something. They were looking for Jesus. And they ultimately found Jesus. 
And, and we know that Jesus Christ, when he, when the mother of our Lord came to town, they found no room for him, and he had to be born in a stable. Because there was no place for our Lord to be born. And I thank God for that. He identified with the lowest of the lowest. He identified with those who were outcasts. He was not born in a mansion. Otherwise, some of us wouldn't be saved today. Glory to God. He was born in a mansion, not a mansion. He was, he, he was born in a stable, not in a stadium where some of us could not go in. So he can, he can show to us he is the savior of everybody. Not just the elite of society, but the very low of society. And therefore Christianity is an awesome way of life. That it doesn't matter our socioeconomic status, doesn't matter our education, our achievement. When we come to Jesus Christ, we are part of the same faith. Part of the same blood. Part of the same hope. Part of the same eternal life. And that's the beauty of Christianity. And so Jesus, after he was born, the Bible says his star appeared in heaven. And the wise man saw something that was unique in the heavens. And I'll take a moment, just think about the wise men. We understand from study that they are astrologers who study the planet. And so as they study the planet in this moment in time, they saw the star. And, and, and as you look at these individuals from Babylon, the area, the vicinity of Babylon, we remember that people like Daniel had been in Babylon. And I believe there had been a deposit of the Messianic expectation by folk like Daniel in the Persian area. You remember after, after Daniel had done so much exploit, the king had, had authorized that the God of Daniel should be worshipped throughout his territory. And you remember Daniel was in the lion's den and Daniel could have been consumed by the lion. And by his adversity he was promoted. And the news went out that the God of Daniel should be worshipped in all of the territory. And so the seed had been sown and perpetuated over the years. And there was a, a desire and an understanding by folk who lived in the Persian area that a Messiah was going to come. Because people like Daniel and all the prophets, all prophets of old had prophesied it. And because of their quest for knowledge, they began to try to understand when would this happen. And so years down the road, you find these individuals gazing into the heavens and they saw something unique. They saw a star that was different from the rest of them. It, it might not be a regular star like we see in heaven today. It could be like the fire by night and the cloud by day while the Israelites left Egypt. And so they saw something different. They saw him, they saw the star, the Bible say, in the east. And so it might have been coming from the west. And we know that the, the, the sun doesn't set from the, doesn't rise from the west. Rises from the east and then goes to the west. There's, the stars come from the east and goes to the west. But you have this individual in the east and they can see something rising from the west. And sometimes God turns things upside down for his glory. And to the confusion of my kind. And so we have to try to figure out God. And so when they saw this, they, they knew that there was something about it that is unique. What is it that you have known about God that shows you the uniqueness of God? As you begin to see God in a different light and understand the uniqueness of God, it shapes your relationship with Him. As a matter of fact, it betters your relationship with Him. That's how you begin to walk with God and fearlessly follow in Him and reverently serve in Him. Knowing that He's worthy to be worshipped and worthy to be served. Hallelujah to God. And so when they saw this body right in the sky, they, they thought that something had happened. They knew that it belongs to a king. And it was not, not just an ordinary king, but the king of all kings. And they felt the need to go find Him. It was not easy finding Jesus with these individuals. And Jesus never promised us a smooth sail. And when the disciples came to Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, and said to Jesus, we've left everything. And indeed they did. They left everything. They left their mothers. They left their fathers. The disciples left their wives. 
left all their businesses and they came to follow Jesus. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, we have left all these things to follow you. What would be our reward? Man is always seeking reward. We're always seeking, God, what would you do for me? What is in this for me? Lord, I'm serving you. What is in this for me? Lord, I wake up every morning. I go to church. What is in this for me? Man is always seeking for a reward. And so they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what will be my reward after I have left everything? And Jesus said to them, don't worry. You will receive a hundredfold of all the things that you left, but you will also receive persecution. So he didn't leave them in doubt that Christianity is not going to be a smooth sail. There'll be time of shedding tears. There'll be time of sorrow. There'll be time of pain and ache. But there'll also be time of joy and happiness. And that's why the sermon said, even when my tears shall endure for a night, but my joy comes in the morning. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel, however long and dark the tunnel may be. There's always a light at the end of it. So Jesus did not leave us in doubt that finding him might not be easy. You may need to look all over. You may need to search all over. But I can guarantee you as we search all over, we can never find anyone like him. No one is loving like him. No one is kind like him. No one is compassionate like him. No one cherishes you like Jesus would. Glory to God. And so they set out on a journey to try to find him. Just as you and I are on a journey. And Paul states it very rightly. That we are running a race. And that we should run the race that is set before us. There's a race that's set before you. A race that will end up in a place called eternal life. Called, called heaven. In a place of eternity. And we all must run that race to the end. He that overcome it. It is only he that overcome it. It is good to start. Like I say many times there are good starters and bad finishers. There are bad starters and very good finishers. And there are those who don't start at all. It's not so much how I started, it's how I finish. Because the journey is going to be challenging. And the question is, am I able to endure all of the arrows that comes, all of the things that come at me, the wind, the wave, the, the torrent that come at me. Am I able to withstand those? Only those who overcome. And so here we see these individuals setting out, seeking for something. Seeking to understand the fulfillment of a prophecy that they have heard or something they have read about or told about. A seed that had been sown many years before. But they saw something in heaven that they were willing to follow. They didn't understand it. They walk with it by faith. Our walk with God is absolutely a walk of faith. They, they're following something they saw in heaven that they believed will lead them to somewhere. They didn't have to see the destination. I've said that before. That you got to be willing to pay the price of the journey because the destination is more important to you than the beginning of the journey and the journey in its entirety. They're willing to go this journey to find the king of kings following a star that they saw in heaven. They could have been wrong that what they saw in heaven meant nothing. So their journey would have been in vain. But there was faith in it. And that faith drove them throughout the journey. They left the east. And they're coming to Jerusalem. Following the star. And so the journey. Some of us might not have understood. That the journey didn't take a day or two. Back in the day they didn't have aircraft. They didn't have vehicles. So their journey took quite a while. And we have seen the nativity and, and the wise men as part of the nativity that we see today. The account of the scripture does not support that. The wise men did not come to the stable. They didn't find Jesus in the manger. Because time has elapsed 
from the moment they saw the star when the boy was born until they got to Jerusalem. And again, it was a journey. And how do we know that? If you look at verse 11 of this chapter, chapter 2 of Matthew, it said, And when they were come into where? The house. So Christ has moved from the stable to a house. Initially, there was no room in the inn, so they found a cave where animals were being bred, and the mother Jesus and Joseph camped there. And Christ was born there and placed in a manger. And now by the time the wise men came to Jerusalem. And by the time they found Jesus. Not clear whether they found Jesus in Bethlehem or in Nazareth. Jesus was in the house. Not only that Jesus was in the house, they came into the house. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Now, young child. So, he's no longer a baby. So, time has lapsed between when they saw the star and when they found the baby. What am I trying to bring out there? So, you're looking at a period between at least... Six months, one year to two years has passed. And during this period of time, you have these wise men following the star. How many of us sitting here today will follow the star on foot or on Karma's back for about two years? Looking for the Savior. And that's how serious it was to these individuals. They were willing to pay the price of the journey and be in the Paris of thieves and weather. And they came through the desert trying to find the master because it was important for them to worship him. If it was that important for these individuals to come in and worship the Lord having gone through what they went through, then there's something about Jesus that's different. There's something about him that they knew that some people don't know today. They took a journey from their homeland, left their businesses, left their family, left everything, and they journeyed for at least minimum six months and maybe up to two years. How do we know that? When Herod decided to find a baby, he asked them a question. When did they see the star? When? About what time? He inquired of them. When did the star appear? Now verse 7. He said, then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So, when they got to Herod, Herod was not asking them about that moment. He was asking them, when did they see it the first time? And it happened the first time when the baby was born. So, he diligently inquired of them, when did the star first appear? They would have told Herod about what time they saw the star. And Herod was trying to get information so that when he authorized his people to kill the little babies, he would know the range of age to target. So this was very, very important intelligent gathering on Herod's part. So Herod wanted to know when was the child born. And so when he, when he authorized the death of the children after he got upset that the wise man didn't come back. What Herod said to them was, kill every child two years and under. So the information he got from the wise man helped him to decide what age range to target. So what am I saying from that? Jesus would have been 
about two years old at the time. So th this, this event of the star appearing and the meeting of Herod should be maximum two years. And maybe a little under, maybe a year. So the journey that they took to find Christ was a longer journey than we think today. Some of us feel, well, the wise men just appeared after Jesus was born and Jesus was still in the stable and they came in while the mother of uh, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ was feeding the baby and Joseph running around and he had appeared the wise men. No. No. Not at all. Event had passed. Time has lapsed. By the time they came, Jesus had already been presented in Jerusalem according to the custom of the people to present at the temple. The wise men had not appeared at the time. So they'd gone to the temple, eight days, presented Jesus at the temple as part of the tradition of the Jews. And it's also possible that Jesus had gone to Egypt after, after that that the Lord had authorized them and came back to Nazareth. It's possible. We don't know that. But the fact of the matter is that it took a while before the wise men finally found Jesus. And they were willing to continue the journey. And not only that, as they were going to find Christ, Herod told them, when you find him, Come back and give me words. Come tell me. They did not obey Herod. Because in the journey of finding Jesus, there will be distractions. You're going to find people that will make you not continue in your journey. You're going to find folk who will offend you. You're going to find folk who will deceive you. You're going to find folk who will try to dissuade you. So why do you have to do that? You have to go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. Do you really have to worship God like that? Can't you do it in the comfort of your home? After all, you're still Christian. You're going to find folk who will tell you that. And now when you look at folk like that, they are not God worshipers. They don't go to church. They're not interested in what you're doing. Satan is using them. And you got to beware of folk like that. And so you have this wise man. You know, we say three wise men. We don't know if they're three. <laughs> Glory to God. The, the number three came from the type of gift that they presented. They presented frankincense and my and, and, and one other gift. I've forgotten that now. And those three gifts... Those three gifts for us represent three people. No, it's more than three. It's more than three. They're not three wise men like we see or say today. And, 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 when, they, and when they were going, Harold said, you go, bring, bring what's back to me. And what happened, as soon as they left Herod, the angel of God appeared to them and said, don't go to back to Herod. Don't go back to Herod. But they did not stop looking for the star, following the star, until they found the child. They did not stop looking for the star or following the star until they found Jesus. They didn't stop. So you cannot stop serving God and worshiping God until... You get to heaven. Can't stop it. Don't let nothing stop you from finding Jesus finally. We have all found Jesus here on earth. By virtue of the fact that we are saved. Right? You found Jesus or Jesus found you. That's why you're here today. The journey continues. It doesn't stop. Until we find him in the, on the last day, we got to follow the star. This individual did not stop following the star. 
they continued until they found Jesus. What Herod said didn't matter to them. What is Herod saying to us today? Herod is saying to us, kill the child. Herod is saying to us, bring me worse back so that I can go worship the he's lion. He's not going to worship him. He's going to kill him. Herod wants to kill your worship. Herod wants to kill your relationship. Herod wants to stop you and me from finding Christ. But the wise men continue in their wisdom until they found the child. And when they found the child in verse 11, and when they came into the house and they saw the young child, Mary, and fell down and did what? And worship. And they opened their treasure. Now, they can be three, it can be more, it can be two. We don't know how many. But today, like I said, we said there are three wise men. But it may be. The Bible don't, didn't tell us the number. But that doesn't really matter. The most important thing is that you have these men who are willing to do all that they did to find the Lord. They were worshippers. You have to be a believer to worship. And worship for them shouldn't have started on that day. So in their private life where they lived, they might have been worshiping Jesus, the Messiah, in anticipation that he's going to come from the lesson that they have learned from others who came before them. And so when they finally found him, the first thing they did was worship the Lord. So when you find Christ and you have, the next thing you got to do is to be a worshiper. To be what? A worshiper. Worshiping means different things to different people. Worship could be you coming to church and just blessing the Lord and magnifying his name. Worship could be singing to the Lord in the privacy of your home and when you come to service. Worship could be giving your time to the Lord in, in worship and, and praise. However the Lord impresses in your heart to worship, keep worshiping the Lord. And not only that they worship, and the Bible said they opened their treasure. They opened their treasure. And, and this is where we find a tradition when, when children are born newly, we open our treasure. We, we bless those children with our treasure. So they saw this child, they blessed the presented unto him, the Bible say, gift, gold, representing kingship. They acknowledge that he is king. So they found him, they worship him, they acknowledge him. You have found him, I found him. Are we worshiping? If we're not, let's start to worship him. As the king of kings and the lord of lords. And then they acknowledge him. Acknowledge him as king. Presented him gold. Acknowledge him as the prophet. And they gave him frankincense. And priest. And then they gave him Maya. And that's signifying his death. So you look at them acknowledging that he is king of kings. They acknowledge he is the priest and the prophet. And that they are acknowledging him as the one who will pay for our salvation. And this, this experience here of the wise men, I believe, left a mark in their lives. And after they left the room, they would have been rejoicing that they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Could it be that these were the first born again people? <laughs> Could it be these were the first born again believers? It was not the Jews. These were Gentiles. Could it be that they were the first born again people? Because they accepted Christ. Well, Herod and all Jerusalem, that's what the Bible says, Herod and all Jerusalem were troubled. 
They were busy getting troubled. <laughs> Look at verse 3. It said, when Herod the king heard these things, what happened? He was troubled and what? All Jerusalem. All the Jews, all the people who live in Jerusalem, they were troubled with Herod. And here you come, Gentiles, coming from Babylon, and they come to worship, and they acknowledge the master and savior who had been born, and they went home rejoicing. And, and now see what happens to tell you how holy they were and full of faith. Verse 12. And being one of who? Of who? Verse 12. And being one of who? Of God. Now God appeared to them. God doesn't appear to unrighteous people. You got to be a man or woman of faith and somebody who believe God. So their belief in the Son of God right there and then opened the door for them to have God's attention. And as soon as they worship him, they acknowledge him, they saw him, they found him, they presented him the gift that they gave to him. And immediately, the Bible said God appeared to them in a dream. The Lord appeared to them in a dream. That, that they should not return to Herod. And they departed unto their own way, to their own country. Now, Herod told them to come back. But God told them, don't go. Who do we obey? God or man? God. And again, tells you that these people are close to God. So when God spoke to them, they knew it was God. I, I don't know if they've seen God before. So they knew it was God. How did they know it was God? How did they know? There's got to be something in them, a relationship that they build with God. These are astrologers. These are very knowledgeable people, very educated individuals. And when they saw that dream, they knew it was God. It wasn't fantasy. And they obey that instruction. And they went to their country. How? Another way. There's, there's some folks that you just got to go to your country another way. <laughs> Glory to God. You, you got to just take the, an alternative route and bypass them because they're not adding value to your Christianity. Or to your life. So what are we saying today in closing? Men set out to find Jesus. And they set for us an example. That number one, we need to be sensitive to what God is saying and doing. They were sensitive enough that they saw something that was unusual. And we need to be willing to pay the price to find the Lord. Look at the journey that they took to and fro. So when they came, they had to go back to their country. And it took quite a while and journey for them to get there. It wasn't easy. They would have gone through a lot and, and paid a lot and, 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 and endure so much to find their way. To meet the Lord. And when they found him. They accepted him. As their Lord and Savior. And they began to worship him. And they presented to him. Items. That signify who he was. Acknowledging him. As their king. Their priest and prophet. And the one who will ultimately die. On the cross for their salvation. And God appeared to them. And warned them. And they obeyed the voice of God. They didn't obey their voice. Nor the voice of man. So this is a huge lesson for us. As we celebrate this Christmas season. Let us remember. That it's all about. Jesus. Not about you and me. It's all about Jesus. 
And like we said, as we studied in the book of Revelation, if, if our worship sent us on the child in a manger, he left the manger. They found him in a house. In my father's house, there are many mansions. That's what he said. They found him in a house. He left the manger. I'm not saying it's not good to have the nativity scene. You can have the nativity scene, but that's not the object of your worship. No, it's not. It's not the object of your worship. Jesus left the manger. He was in a house now. And today, he is in the father's house. Waiting for you and for me. That on that day, when the trumpet shall sound, glory to God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And all of the people, maybe you and me, will still be here. We shall be caught up to meet with him in heaven. It's going to be role reversal. They left their country looking for Jesus. On that day, Jesus is going to leave his country looking for his people. And we will go to him. Glory to God. And the question is, are you ready? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now. We give you the glory and the honor. We give you the praise and the worship. Thank you for this moment. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that we draw from the wise men who made this treacherous journey to find the Savior of the world. Lord, we just pray that we will not be hearers only, but doers also. Give us the grace, Lord. Give us the fortitude. Give us the staying power. Let your Holy Spirit be with us. Don't let us be dissuaded by those around us and the things and the voices around us. Let us always listen to the voice of God and follow the voice of God. Father, we thank you for it. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Celebrate Jesus. If you have been blessed by this message or have a prayer request, we would like to hear about it. Please call us at 401-954-6188 or visit our website at www.kingstabernacle.org. You are also welcome to join us on Sundays for services beginning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. and for Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 500 Greenville Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. Please remember that you are always welcome at King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations.